Good morning and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to today's webcast. Are you prepared for more high impact vulnerabilities? Risk mitigation and an incidence response strategies for the next heart bleed or shell shock. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of the presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items with you. First of all, please make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it's turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is being presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you have any kind of technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenter, today, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We'll have a short Q&A session at the end of the presentation, time permitting. And lastly, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Also, you may earn a CPE credit for attending today. Now let's get on with the presentation. Today our presenter is Ken Weston, Senior Security Analyst at Tripwire. To see Ken's bio, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your screen. So now, without further delay, I'll turn it over to Ken Weston. Take it away, Ken. Thanks, Kate. Um, yes. Thanks, Kate. So uh, yeah, hi, my name is Ken Weston. I am a, a security analyst here at Tripwire. Um, and today we'll be discussing the high impact vulnerabilities such as Heartbleed, Shellshock, and others we have seen um, over the past year. Um, you know, when Heartbleed hit, uh, many people thought it was a one-off, sort of a freak occurrence. However, uh, we started seeing more like Shellshock, Poodle, you know, we've seen Freak, um, and a number of others um, that have hit um, uh, our environments. And uh, we're not realizing that in many respects these high impact vulnerabilities are the new norm. Um, some analysts actually expect to see uh, these types of vulnerabilities hit at least once per quarter. As such, I think um, it's time for organizations to really establish strong strategies to deal with these types of vulnerabilities in their environments, um, both taking the preventative measures as well as developing response plans for detect, uh, detecting remediation. Um, it really is de different from dealing with um, other types of vulnerabilities, um, you know, where we usually do scheduled maintenance, um, you know, we patch them every month. Um, it follows a very, you know, um, sort of linear path, whereas a lot of these high impact vulnerabilities, it requires a different mindset. Um, and at least when I talk with companies and I uh, talk with a lot of people in the industry, I'm finding that um, a lot of organizations are really not prepared for this type of um, vulnerability. Um, it's sort of a fire drill in many respects when they're trying to uh, mitigate the risk here. Um, so this presentation is going to outline some um, strategies of how to deal with that using existing frameworks. Um, and so to, to start it off, I want to, uh, first of all, we want to uh, define, you know, what exactly is a high impact vulnerability? And I think the, the, the shortest uh, definition is simply, it's a vulnerability that has both a wide distribution and a high risk of exploitation. Um, so if we look at things like Heartbleed, Shellshock, and Poodle, um, the reason they're viewed as high impact vulnerabilities is because they're so widespread. Uh, Poodle, the Heartbleed, Freak, um, all of those vulnerabilities affect OpenSSL, which are then linked to a lot of other libraries um, and uh, applications, be it um, email systems, web servers, um, you know, it's very, um, it's very widespread throughout our environment. And then Shellshock is one that was very dangerous because of its ability for uh, remote exploitation. Um, across a wide uh, number of different um, servers that are out there. Um, and so we'll be talking about some of these uh, more in depth here. So uh, we all remember Heartbleed. It's sort of the, uh, the poster child for the high impact vulnerabilities. Um, it was discovered by a group of security researchers that affect OpenSSL. Um, I have this, uh, you know, this XKCD comic, which I think explains uh, the vulnerability <laughs> really well. Uh, this is something a lot of people would uh, send out to their management to help explain what exactly it is. 
Um, basically, it allowed um, an attacker to steal open SSL keys, the private keys, um, secondary keys, and basically retrieve about um, you know, 64 kilobytes of memory from an affected server. Um, and they could uh, continually um, sort of query that information um, from that server. And the real challenge with this particular vulnerability was that um, there was really no way to detect it until um, there were signatures that were available. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, because th there wasn't any sort of trace or any file, um, anything that written to the file system. Um, there were no binaries unless, of course, they were able to compromise that server. Um, they were able to log into it. So information was being basically harvested from systems without um, the uh, organization uh, really knowing about it for you know, anywhere from a, a week to longer, depending on um, when they were able to deploy those signatures um, and patch those systems. So if we look at it, you know, for Harpley, there was an, an active exploit. It was released almost immediately. Um, actually, the test itself was an exploit, which actually raised a lot of other challenges because um, um, you know a lot of people were running, um, you know, these wide, massive internet scans, actually looking for this vulnerability. Um, and even when we had those snort signatures, basically every single test that someone was pinging looked like it was an attack. Um, so it's very difficult for folks, even when they had th those signatures in place, to actually identify, you know, is this just a, a harmless test? Is this security researchers? Or is this someone actually trying to harvest um, information from my environment? Um, and a lot of honeypots that I actually run, I actually still see um, a lot of these pings. Um, some of them are uh, potentially malicious attackers, um, but other times it's just um, security researchers trying to identify you know, how widespread this, spread this vulnerability still is. So, um, you know, the information, uh, the, the, the exploit would harvest uh, information and RAM, you know, and it can steal credentials, keys, and a lot of other sensitive data. Um, this was particularly dangerous because it affected, you know, roughly two-thirds of the Internet uh, connected systems. Um, so, you know, open SSL is incredibly widespread. It's used everywhere. Um, and it really was dangerous because there was no trace until this IDS signature was provided, um, unless you were, you know, sniffing out things like full packet capture and archiving that. Uh, and most environments aren't set up to be able to do that type of thing. Um, and also there's a, a, a pretty lengthy amount of time where systems were actually exposed to the exploit before uh, systems were patched. Um, even when the patches were available, it took organizations a long time uh, for them to deploy those patches. Um, and that really is one of the big challenges with dealing with high-impact vulnerabilities is, um, first of all, identifying what systems have been compromised or could have been compromised, um, and ensuring that those systems um, do get patched quickly. Then we have uh, Shellshock, which was sort of a different type of um, vulnerability. Um, it affected Bash, um, and this one was really dangerous because it allowed remote code execution, uh, where this is something where someone can actually uh, start um, executing commands on the server. Um, you know, they can do all sorts of uh, nefarious activities. Um, there's actually quite a few um, automated exploits through Metasploit and other frameworks um, that actually automate this process. Um, and that's something that uh, I should note is really dangerous because um, a lot of the the CVSS scores that actually rate these vulnerabilities don't take that into account. And I'll be discussing some of the challenges with that um, a little further on in the presentation around, you know, how do you score um, these, um, uh, these particular vulnerabilities. Um, so the uh, exploit for this, again, was available uh, nearly immediately. Um, and um, I still, again, I have honeypots, and I'm seeing um, you know, exploit attempts uh, using Shellshock regularly. Um, and, you know, it, this does allow for remote exploit with reverse shell. Um, but the one thing with this is uh, it's very different from um, Heartbleed is that um, you can actually go retroactively and look back and see um, where this exploit uh, may have hit by looking at, you know, your Apache logs, like the access logs. Um, so there was actually a way to identify, um, you know, if an exploit was actually targeting this system. And we'll talk a little bit about that where, you know, it's great if you have that sort of evidence because then you can identify here's when the system was vulnerable, um, here's how, when it was exploited, and then we can actually go back and identify if there were any um, unauthorized changes made to that system. So Poodle um, was a little bit, uh, bit of a different type of uh, 
uh, vulnerability. It did hit uh, OpenSSL, uh, which was uh, similar to other exploits we've seen. Um, it, it was widespread, but it's uh, difficult and un unlikely to um, be used in an exploit. Um, it requires an attacker to be on the same network. Um, it also requires JavaScript. Um, and the attack, it's, it's focused primarily on clients. So this isn't something that you know, I would um, be exploiting against uh, you know, a remote server. I wouldn't be targeting your web server with this. Um, it's more of a man-in-the-middle style attack versus a remote server exploit. Um, so it still has a risk, but it's much less of a risk to the enterprise than other major exploits that we've seen. Um, however, a lot of the, the scoring when it comes to <clears throat> looking at these vulnerabilities for CVSS scores, they don't take that in, into account. So um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, again, some of the challenges with, with the scoring. Then, of course, more recently, we have Freak, which is yet another open SSL vulnerability. Um, you know, it stands for a factor attack on RSA export keys. Um, you know, this resulted in, um, it's a result of encryption export requirements uh, where people and the attacker are actually able to downgrade the encryption between the, the client and the server. Um, and again, it's very similar to Poodle, where um, it requires the person to be on the same network. Um, it became more serious um, with this vulnerability when it came out because um, you know, initially it was found that there was this vulnerability, but then we started seeing the, um, the different operating systems um, that it was actually affecting. So um, it didn't just affect you know, uh, one server operating system, it was actually affecting Windows, Android, OS X, um, and um, even iOS. So um, it, it's a pretty rare to see that you know, this vulnerability affects you know, everything from your servers, your, your laptop systems, all the way down to your mobile devices. So um, that's a, a very unique uh, component of the particular freak attack. Um, but the impact is still similar to Poodle. Um, you know, it requires someone to be on that same network. Um, it raises challenges for, for business users and enterprise when you're you know, using open Wi-Fi like at a Starbucks or an airport, um, but it, it doesn't really pose too much of a threat um, to the, um, the data center or, or servers, for example. I think it's also important to point out that you know, with these high, the high impact vulnerabilities, um, if you've noticed, a lot of them have um, very scary names. Uh, some of them actually have um, you know, very fancy logos. Um, and I've even seen some of these um, high impact vulnerabilities um, get released out and put out by PR teams. But in reality, many of them aren't really high impact vulnerabilities, or there's not a lot of information on them. Um, sometimes some security firms are actually trying to market some of their research as a high impact vulnerability when it's not. Um, so it, sometimes it's very difficult for organizations to sort of filter out the, the, the FUD, which is the, you know, the fear, uncertainty, uh, and doubt factor um, from an actual threat. Um, and you know, not all these high impact vulnerabilities are equal as we've discussed, uh, particularly when it comes to the scoring, which I want to discuss a little bit here. So the, the CVSS, which is used to score vulnerabilities, um, the, especially the version 2, there are some, some issues with it. Um, if we look at uh, the, the ghost vulnerability, you know, this was given a CVSS score of 10. Um, however, in many respects, it, this was not as severe as, as hard bleed, uh, particularly when you look at um, risk to the enterprise. Um, this isn't something allowed for remote exploit or anything like that. Um, we also had another one, which is a Samba remote code execution, which, you know, it's bad, um, but only if someone was able to get onto the network and access those systems. Um, and then, of course, we have Harpley, which surprisingly enough had a CVSS score of 5, um, which, you know, raises a lot of questions is, you know, how, how are these scores actually created? Um, and I looked into this and actually talked with uh, one of our VERT researchers, uh, Tyler Wrigley, um, who's a, a guru when it comes to the scoring stuff. Um, actually, I should mention, too, that uh, Tyler from VERT um, is going to have a presentation at RSA where he uh, discusses a lot of the challenges with scoring of vulnerabilities. Um, so if you are going to be at RSA, um, look out for that. I highly recommend it. Um, so if we look at uh, CVSS2, people say that you know, it, it's modeled after a, a pyramid. Uh, where we have uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, um, all these different components go into the scoring mechanism for it. Um, but actually, if we look at this, um, it, it really isn't a pyramid. It's a triangle. It's, it's really one-dimensional, and it only provides a little bit of information. It only accounts for some information uh, when it comes into that scoring. 
Um, here at Tripwire with our vert team, uh, we have a different model of scoring. Actually, it's, um, it's, a, it's a much more granular um, and actually takes a lot of other information into account. Um, the first is that it's highly dynamic, so um, it'll actually take in um, aspects of risk, um, the, the skill level to, to actually utilize uh, that vulnerability in an exploit, um, the business context of that vulnerability within our environment, um, as well as time. Um, you know, if we look at a lot of these vulnerabilities, they, um, you know, as they age, um, you know, their, their scores should be diminished. Um, and, you know, that's something that doesn't get taken into account for a lot of the CVSS scoring. Or if you want to do that, it's a very intensive manual process. Um, whereas with Tripwire Vert, with your IP360, a lot of this happens automatically. Um, it actually allows you to, um, to uh, set those scores um, yourself. Um, and, you know, if you look at some of the, the range uh, with CVSS, it's 1 to 10, where with the Tripwire Vert, of vulnerability scoring, we're on a range of zero to 60,000. Um, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with the, the in-depth and the granularity, um, taking a lot of different factors into account. Uh, most of this is automated through the IP360 uh, tool, so it's not something that you have to sit there and do the mouth to calculate this. Um, but it allows you to, to quickly um, identify, you know, where the real risk is uh, within your environment. So I do want to give a, a quick shout out to our, our VERT team. Um, and I highly recommend that you go to this URL here, tripwire slash VERT, um, and sign up for our um, uh, our uh, th uh, VERT threat alerts. Um, if you want to get uh, really uh, detailed information around some of these high impact threats as well as uh, monthly updates on vulnerabilities that you should be paying attention to in your environment, um, you know, you sign up for this. You're not signing up for any sort of marketing newsletters or anything like that. Um, we're just going to send you information about um, these high impact vulnerabilities and other threats that are out there in the landscape. Um, and uh, yeah. So, you know, I started looking at, you know, vulnerability trends. How is it that we're seeing all these high impact vulnerabilities? You know, what's different now than, say, a, a year or two ago uh, before we, we um, started seeing things like Heartbleed? Um, and, you know, the vulnerability trends don't really tell us a whole lot if we actually look at the reported vulnerabilities. Sure, we see that there's been an increase, um, but does, does that tell us much about the actual severities of the, these vulnerabilities? Um, it's still fairly evenly distributed. And, you know, really digging deep into it, I'm identifying that a lot of this is because um, just there's been, a lot, there's been a lot more research and more focus on identifying vulnerabilities. Um, if you look at the security industry right now, there's a lot more researchers that are actually poking around applications. Um, and um, when I say security researchers, it's not just, you know, white hats, but also black hats. Um, there's a lot of money that's uh, being made in selling of zero-day exploits or, you know, finding zero days and selling them to um, governments or to even criminal syndicates uh, for them to, to leverage in some of their endeavors. Um, and um, in general, the security industry is seeing a lot of higher pay, um, not just in salaries, but also, you know, in things like bug bounties. Um, and, you know, of course, the, the selling of zero days as well, where um, if you are able, a researcher, and you find a, a vulnerability that affects something like an Internet Explorer or a browser, um, you can sell that for, you know, in the neighborhood of six figures easily. Um, we're also finding that um, security libraries and tools are a top target uh, for these uh, researchers. Um, you know, we're, tar we're seeing it target SSL, encryption, and other related tools. Um, and a lot of those are targeting libraries in particular. Um, so um, the nice thing about attacking a library and finding a vulnerability there is that those are usually embedded and connected to a lot of other applications, be it uh, web servers, mail servers. Um, you'd be surprised how many um, different tools actually um, open SSL is, um, is embedded in. And it's only when we see these high impact vulnerabilities where we actually discover a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, and there's also a lot of challenges, too, with some of these um, because they're embedded flaws. Um, so um, things that are using uh, Linux-based systems, a lot of um, uh, we look at IoT devices, they're embedding a lot of these libraries into them. Um, and that's another reason that um, they're becoming targeted is that those systems can't be updated. If I'm able to identify a flaw in a router, um, odds are it's going to be very difficult for an organization to, uh, or a person even, to update that. Um, finding that, you know, in some of our own research that um, very few people actually update the router firmware um, and on their home <coughs> excuse me <laughs> on their home routers so um, that's that's a significant challenge so 
well, you may think here, this image here, that we're, uh, we're actually looking at uh, you know, deep space through like a Kepler telescope or something, but um, actually what we're looking at is a, um, a libraries of a, uh, a typical Linux distribution. Um, and actually, in this case, this is Ubuntu. Uh, and not only are we looking at the uh, libraries themselves, but we're looking at the connections. We're looking at the dependencies of each one of those libraries. Uh, so if we actually zoom in, for example, and here we're actually able to see all the different dependencies, right? So when we talk about high impact vulnerabilities, right, the um, OpenSSL, it's something that's been used for you know, over a decade, and there's a lot of technical debt that, that gets built up as a result of that. And usually it's just one simple line of code that actually introduces that vulnerability. But we see that there's a huge cascading effect when we look at um, all the different systems that that library affects. Um, and that's where you also see a lot of challenges with the organizations that are, are actually patching these as well. Um, unfortunately, you can't just you know, quickly patch this and release it. There has to be um, quite a bit of testing that, that goes into um, as a result of that. Um, so you can't just you know, rush a patch out there and, and push it. And it also raises a lot of challenges for organizations too, is that when we, we push out these updates is that it can also, um, you know, it could break uh, an application. Um, there is that risk, and especially with these vulnerabilities that could push, get pushed out very, or the patches that get pushed out very quickly. Um, you can push that out to systems and it can have a negative impact on, um, on business systems. Um, or it can even introduce additional vulnerabilities. Um, so I think you see a lot of challenges here with um, a lot of the developers when they have to go out and patch these systems. Uh, so you know, one of my questions to you guys is, you know, um, have you hugged an open source developer lately? Because <laughs> um, uh, they, they sure deserve it. Um, if you look at all the work that they've been doing to, to try to keep these systems um, safe, um, and especially the researchers that are actually digging into this code a lot deeper, um, I have a lot of respect for you know, the guys that over at OpenSSL that are putting a lot of time and effort into making those systems secure, um, making the Internet safer for all of us. So you know, can we prepare for the next big one, so the next big vulnerability that's about to hit? Um, in many respects, I, I view high impact vulnerabilities like earthquakes uh, or what the insurance industry would refer to as an act of God, which by definition is an instance of uncontrollable uh, natural occurrence forces in operation. Um, the natural force in this case being human fallibility. But for our purposes, those, could respons those responsible for managing the security of enterprise environments, these vulnerabilities are largely outside of your control, so in many respects can be viewed as an act of God. So if we actually look at, um, you know, I was actually looking at definitions of risk, and I really like this one, where um, hazard is, is the sum of, you know, or sorry, risk is a, a sum of your hazard exposure and vulnerability. Um, and actually, this doesn't come from InfoSec. It actually comes from, from FEMA. Um, so uh, um, there's a lot of similarities where um, actually all we need to do is um, replace hazard with hacker, um, and it's basically the same definition uh, for, for inf information security. Um, sort of as a, a slight diversion, I found it interesting that uh, FEMA's preparedness cycle actually mirrors uh, a defense in depth cycle in many respects. Um, so there's a lot of uh, comparisons here that can be made. So when, when dealing with risk of earthquakes, you know, FEMA utilizes hazard maps extensively, which <clears throat> are essentially heat maps highlighting areas of risk measured as the likelihood of experiencing earthquake uh, shaken at various intensities. This really allows them to understand where to focus their resources to make the biggest impact in reducing risk. Uh, you guys can just hold on for a second. I'm going to take a drink of water. Sorry about that. So what if we could do the same for our, our IT environments, where we can just as easily identify what systems are most at risk and identify and score hazards and allocate resources accordingly? If we were to create a hazard map of our network, identifying what systems are most at risk when a high impact vulnerability, vulnerability hits, it might look something like this. So our front end systems might have more exposure to the outside world. Things like web servers, um, uh, mail servers, and other systems critical to our customers' employees. But then some of our back end systems may also house, house sensitive data that if compromised could have significant impact on, uh, um, on our environment. And so we flag those as critical assets as well for different reasons. 
So one of the core foundation, foundational things that organizations need to do in order to mitigate risk is to take an inventory of their IT assets, both hardware and software. You cannot secure what you can't see. Um, the next step is then to apply business context to those assets. Tripwire provides this type of scoring of assets at a very granular level, either in groups or individual assets, um, allowing IT organizations to identify what is important in the organization as well as what is most at risk when a vulnerability strikes. When a vulnerability hits, um, uh, sorry, <coughs> when a vulnerability hits, you, you, um, you, the uh, the investment you make here goes a long way to actually incre increase your operational efficiency as your IT staff are able to focus on patching and remediating critical assets first that are most at risk or if compromised pose the greatest risk to your organization. Similarly, we want to score our, our assets. We can score, similar to how we score our assets, we can also score our hazards. This is how uh, the actual scoring screen is laid out in Tripwire IP360, for example, um, as I, I kind of talked about how, um, the scoring algorithm that we use. So it allows organizations to identify the most critical vulnerabilities in their environment. Um, you can drill in and see the devices and, um, and get more uh, richer context around those um, assets and the vulnerabilities that affects them. So one of the best ways to mitigate risk in our uh, environment, whether we're dealing with high impact vulnerabilities or not, is through the application of um, the, the 20 critical security controls. It used to be referred to as the SANS Top 20, um, now it's the CSC 20, um, but they're essentially um, abstracted derivative of the NIST 800.5.3, which I'm also going to be listing um, here. Um, so. Um, the the uh, NIST 800.5.3 is more uh, it's more detailed, almost prescriptive guide for implementing these controls uh, for those folks that are actually in the trenches. Uh, the 20 critical security controls are a great tool, tool for executives to understand security best practices and communicate with security teams with regards to what needs to be done. Where I find the the NIST uh, framework provides uh, more granular details that security and IT teams need to actually implement them thoroughly. Um, at the end of this presentation, I prepared a, um, a high-impact vulnerability survival guide that will actually include a spreadsheet that maps the full CSC 20 to um, NIST 800.5.3 controls. Um, I won't go through them all here in the presentation, but I wanted to list them out as we have both business and more technical leaders here on this uh, webcast today, um, and so this is a great way to communicate this. Um, so the first of the CSC controls deals um, with what we've been talking about already is, is taking inventory of what's in our environment. Um, and this gets um, really in depth. It's not just identifying assets, um, but it's doing it continuously. So as devices come off the network, as new devices get added, um, and there's a lot of other um, more d detailed information that needs to be captured when we do that um, to, to not just identify what's on our network, but also provide that business context I was discussing. So then the, uh, the second security control is, is similar. Um, we're actually going to be looking at not just identifying the hardware that's out there, but um, also identifying the software that's running on them as well. And this is something where we need to actively manage inventory and track and correct um, that information. You know, as we, we um, uh, update systems, as we add new systems, um, we patch them, we install new applications, um, that can be a lot of it would be very difficult for IT organizations to track, but it's critical for us to actually understand our risk posture, especially when one of these high impact vulnerabilities hits, uh, because it, we need to identify what systems in our environment are affected. Um, what systems in our environment um, actually are affected by the OpenSSL vulnerability? Um, and it's not just OpenSSL itself, but we're looking at things like uh, web servers, mail servers, um, OpenVPN, um, a lot of other software and applications that are utilizing that library, and we need to quickly identify that. So then when we talk about earthquakes, um, you know, there's a, a lot of um, other information um, that, that's useful. So, um, you know, we identify high-risk environments, and then when we have buildings in those high-risk environments, we earthquake-proof them. Um, and there's a lot more, um, like, building uh, policies that they go into place, um, you know, that um, to help protect those buildings. Um, and we want to do the same within our environment. So we want to um, actually utilize the, the uh, third security control, which deals with secure configurations for hardware. Um, laptops, workstations, and servers in our environment. 
So we want to identify, you know, sort of the gold standard. We want to identify, uh, you know, what's the, the, the best way to configure this system, develop that gold standard, um, and then if anything were to shift from that, we want to be alerted to that, and it's very important. And configuration is also important because a lot of times these um, high impact vulnerabilities and the exploits allow an attacker to really quickly get past our perimeter defenses. So uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, take this sort of defense in depth strategy where we've um, taken a lot of time to secure inside of the network and ensure that, you know, if they do get in, um, that, you know, the, the rest of the network um, is, isn't easy for them to access. So it's critical for organizations to uh, make sure that systems are configured properly um, and um, have some visibility into that as well. And then we're going to get into Critical Security Control 4, which of course deals with continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation. So, um, you know, a lot of people will do, you know, their, uh, their scans of their environment, um, but it's not really um, helpful if you're not able to have a continuous vi visibility of what's, what vulnerabilities are in your environment. Um, as I mentioned, as you patch systems, as new systems come on board, um, a lot changes in our environment. There's a lot moving. Um, and that's why you really need more of a, a vulnerability management solution um, to, uh, to sort of do this um, automatically on a regular basis. Um, especially when a high impact vulnerability hits, um, you need to quickly go through and identify those systems. Um, and sort of um, out of order here, I want to also highlight Critical Security Control 10, uh, which deals with the security configuration of network devices such as firewalls, routers, and switches. So um, we need to um, pay attention to not only our traditional um, servers and laptops and things like that, but also um, look at um, our routers, our network devices, um, things that are more often than not um, kind of have a lot of challenges um, to, to update them. Um, here in Portland, I actually I noticed that there was these really strange U signs on a lot of old buildings, um, and I, I couldn't figure out what the heck is that. Uh, and so I actually started asking around, and a coworker mentioned that, um, oh, that's a sign that basically says that building is unsafe. Um, so uh, a lot of organizations, um, uh, when firefighters or uh, first responders come to these buildings, um, they need to know that, hey, you know, if you go in this building, um, there may not be a way out. Um, it's really dangerous. Be cautious. Um, it may actually um, affect the decision to go into those buildings in the first place. Um, and if there is an earthquake, of course, these buildings are, are very unsafe. Um, so it kind of ties in with our, our FEMA <laughs> analogy again. Um, but um, I kind of view a lot of um, devices in our, our environment in the same way. When we look at network devices, such as firewalls and router switches, um, you know, sometimes those systems can't be updated at all, or um, it's more likely that there's not going to be um, patches available for them as quickly. Um, and we need to be able to tag those um, devices. Um, for example, in Tripwire Enterprise and other tools, uh, we actually provide that capability where you can actually tag that asset um, and say, you know, you can, you can basically paste a big U on it um, so that the rest of your team is aware um, that that asset is there. Um, so when a, a high impact vulnerability does hit, if for whatever reason, and um, it is affected and you're not able to patch that system, um, then additional steps will need to be taken to, to isolate it from the rest of the network or, or to better secure it. Um, so um, just, just something to keep in mind. So we, uh, here at Tripwire, we talk a lot about the enterprise threat gap, um, you know, where we have this sort of clock, right? Um, and it's very similar with our high impact vulnerabilities. So uh, we have our detection gap, you know, we have a short amount of time where we can actually go through and detect it when a new uh, vulnerability and exploit is announced. Um, we have the remediation gap, which is, you know, the time that we have it takes to actually uh, to, to remediate and limit the damage. And then, of course, the prevention gap, uh, where we actually, um, the measures that we actually put in place to um, to, you know, be a patching or whatever to avoid that um, from happening again. Um, but when you get into incident response, so we're moving away from risk, um, there's a few things that we can do. Um, there's the preparation and prevention. We want to go through a phase of detection analysis, um, and then we want to do containment and remediation, and then, of course, we'll have uh, a post um, incident activity. And this is a little bit different in how this flows, and it's not necessarily circular. Um, when we look at detection analysis, um, these sort of feed on each other. Um, so as we're actually going through and remediating a particular vulnerability, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take several passes. It's very rare where you're going to detect the vulnerability and then uh, remediate it quickly. Um, there's a lot of uh, work that has to happen um, 
in the trenches. Um, so you're going to identify your high risk um, assets, you know, as we discussed in our heat map. Um, you're going to, you know, hit those systems first, um, but then there's going to be additional systems and additional work that your team is going to need to do to um, continually remediate, uh, remediate those uh, systems on your network. Um, and not just the systems directly on your network, but other devices that may connect to the network, um, trusted business partners, and things like that. And then we also have the, the post-incident activity when we actually start looking at, you know, what went wrong, you know, what can we improve, um, and that does a lot to help, um, you know, for the next uh, high-impact vulnerability. You know, how can we go through and, you know, do a better job um, to not only uh, help prevent this, but also um, speed up our incident response times? Is there something we can do to, to help automate that? So the first thing we want to do in our, our preparation prevention is the vulnerability identification. So uh, when a new high impact vulnerability hits, you know, we want to identify how quickly can you answer this question? What systems are impacted? Um, and this is where a lot of times people are scrambling. Um, you know, they don't know. Um, we also need to be able to identify which of these um, systems are publicly facing um, and which systems are critical assets. So what systems are critical for business continuity and what, business, what systems actually house sensitive data? So if we've done our homework um, where we actually did a lot with the risk mitigation and we've, we've um, identified and we've taken uh, inventory of our assets, we know what software is running on them, uh, we've done a lot here to, um, for our, our incident response team to quickly identify this information. Um, you know, if you're trying to scramble to figure this out, um, you know, this can take a long time. If you're using spreadsheets or whatever, um, you know, you're, you're in a lot of trouble here. So then the next thing is patching for high impact vulnerabilities. And it's very different from uh, routine patches uh, like we've seen with key vendors distributions from uh, Linux distributions, Microsoft, or, or others, where this is, it's, it's sort of out of band, right? So security teams need to ensure um, that their IT teams and the organizations are able to quickly issue urgent patches. Um, I've been really surprised to see a lot of organizations really are not prepared for this. Um, everything has to be sort of scheduled at a cadence, um, and not just you know, technical resources, but also people resources need to be scrambled to, to make sure that this happens in a timely fashion. Um, as per the, the CSC 1 and 2 we discussed, it requires having an updated inventory of all system applications, endpoints, servers, and devices, and IT security teams need to be confident and have documentation on how to update those systems, particularly when we're looking at some of those network devices that we're discussing. Um, it's a very critical component. So the next step we're going to look at is the, you know, the detection and analysis. So, you know, after systems have been patched, there needs to be a continuous monitoring of the environment for that vulnerability. Um, you know, running one simple vulnerability scan isn't going to cut it nowadays. Um, it needs to be a continuous scan, and it needs to happen on a regular basis. Uh, when a new device is introduced to that environment, it also should be automatically scanned uh, for other, this uh, high impact vulnerability as well as others. Um, we want to make sure that RDS, IPS, firewalls, and antivirus systems, they should all be updated to identify potential exploit signatures targeting these vulnerabilities in your environment. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, like a log intelligence tool or a SIM is going to help you with. So if we actually look at where some of this um, data comes from, when we want to get um, into some precursors and indicator um, data sources, so we can get alerts and signatures from um, ID, IDP, uh, IPS systems. Um, if you have a SIM, uh, be it ArcSight, uh, Tripwire Log Center, or similar tools, um, you antivirus, uh, file integrity monitoring, of course, you know, Tripwire Enterprise does a great job with that. Um, we're going to get a lot of information from logs you know, about operating systems, services, and applications. Uh, network devices, um, and this not isn't just tied directly to um, the uh, vulnerability itself, but also um, if a system was compromised, we need to quickly go through and identify what other security events happened on that device. Um, what configuration changes were made um, in the window that that device was compromised, um, and you know having log information that your security team can go back and audit um, is really going to help them identify that. Um, if you don't collect that information, then there's no evidence for them to go off of, um, and it, you have a situation where it's sort of like a murder without without a body, right? Um, we're not going to be able to actually identify um, um, any information around that particular intrusion. Um, also, third-party threat intelligence, um, we, we do a lot with that at Tripwire nowadays um, uh, th through our third-party integrations with LastLine and uh, several others uh, through with Tripwire Enterprise where we can get uh, you know, malware file hashes, IP addresses, um, identify uh, mutexes and registry issues. Um, and then, of course, um, people. I think a lot of times um, in IT and security we forget about that, um, but we'll get a lot of information from employees and contractors um, noticing something isn't right about a server, business partners, or 
uh, even our customers and external parties, parties who may uh, notice a security issue with uh, one of our web servers. Um, and of course, the media. Um, I think uh, I monitoring the media for you know some of these high impact vulnerabilities. Um, you know, it helps me make sense of it. Um, and it's, it's just as important as watching the news uh, when you know a, a natural disaster strikes. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, publications that are out there. Um, I think it's important to identify a, a reputable news source. Um, there's a lot of uh, news sources out there that will actually put out a lot of FUD. Um, but you know, look at things like SC Magazine or um, Dark Reading or some other uh, folks that focus more on information security um, to get more information about a particular high impact vulnerability as they hit. So next we want to look at you know, the containment and remediation. So uh, between when the vulnerability was announced and systems were patched, uh, systems may have been compromised, especially when act active exploits are available like we've seen with um, Heartbleed and Shellshock. Uh, systems were vulnerable and exposed. Um, they should have um, passwords and keys changed. Uh, you know, um, also, systems should be audited to detect any changes that were made while they were vulnerable for signs of intrusion and compromise. Uh, system configuration should also be compared to you know, your gold standard, um, so if they need to be put back into that tr uh, secure and trusted state. Um, if a system is believed to have been compromised, security teams should isolate that system if possible. Um, if needed, uh, forensic procedures may need to be deployed to save an image of that compromised system before wiping or you know, making any changes to it. Uh, sometimes that's not possible um, in order to you know, keep up with business um, continuity, but um, still it's, um, it's good to, to work with the security teams. Uh, and again, that's really important to have a plan in place um, with how you communicate with them. Um, and note, some compromised systems, you know, they may need to stay up, uh, but you know, contain them as much as possible to, to keep operations running. So after we've um, had an incident, we want to, um, you know, everything's patched, remediated. Um, you know, we want, their additional cleanup and monitoring will be required, as I mentioned. Um, it's really important to identify weaknesses in the response process, whether it's technical or people-oriented. And I guarantee you, uh, no process is going to be perfect, um, especially with these, these uh, high-impact vulnerabilities. They, they tend to affect um, all types of different environments. Um, they're going to touch on different areas of our environment that you know, we're usually not prepared for. Um, and you know, no process is going to, you know, to fit all. Um, so it's really important to, to kind of factor that in. But um, when we look at these, when systems fail or when there are issues, it's really important to identify that. Um, you know, are there additional steps that can, we can take to improve uh, preventative measure as well as increase response and remediation time? And I think also that post-incident um, activity, um, and it gives us an opportunity to identify, you know, can more of this be automated? Um, can the vulnerability analysis, can a lot of the information gathering, can, can this be automated to help increase our, our response times? And a lot of times um, the answer to that is going to be yes. So to give you some examples, um, you know, with Shellshock, uh, you know, almost immediately there were exploits. Um, here is one that's in Metasploit. Um, but you know, the, the nice thing with this one was that there were, were uh, records of the, um, any sort of exploit attempts um, in like Apache access logs. Um, sorry, it's kind of uh, grainy here. The image quality isn't so good. But uh, down below, you see an actual um, you know, entry in an access log. Um, and actually, here at Tripwire, with uh, Tripwire Log Center, we actually release content almost immediately uh, for our customers to, to quickly identify identify that, um, not just in real time, um, but also to be able to go back and um, scan those logs um, historically for any information, um, you know, to see if there was uh, a SIF system that may have been compromised. Um, and that's, that's really important. So you know, here's an example of the rules where you know, actually it's a drag and drop rule that, was, um, be, that users could create. Um, and then here's a report where we're able to identify what systems may have been, um, been compromised by that particular exploit. was another one here. So another one was, you know, Heartbleed. Uh, you know, there wasn't a way to detect that initially. Um, just sort of an interesting timeline here. Um, you know, exploits started appearing around uh, the 10th or 12th of April. Um, and then the FBI actually issued um, some snort signatures. Um, there were signatures available for IDS a little bit earlier than that, but um, they were more, uh, you know, widely available to a larger audience around the 16th. But, you know, there still is that gap, right, of when those systems were vulnerable. So just an example with Tripwire, um, you know, how you, we would mitigate Heartbleed, for example. 
um, when those signatures were available, <coughs> um, you know, intrusion detection systems, um, you know, Tripwire Log Center actually provides um, uh, rules of, um, uh, for a lot of uh, most in IDS systems and next-gen firewalls. Um, you know, alerts can be sent uh, directly in, into Tripwire Log Center. Um, of course, the reporting is also available. Um, and then uh, IP360, you know, it actually identifies, hey, when there is an attack that comes through, it says, yes, um, this particular system is actually vulnerable to this. Um, and so it will actually get some additional um, sort of intelligence around that particular uh, attack. And that's something that now we really need to pay attention to. And then Tripwire Enterprise will provide us the capability to really dig deep and identify, okay, this system was compromised, um, it was vulnerable between, you know, this time frame. Um, we can quickly go through and identify, you know, what changes were made on that system. Um, if something was, you know, if uh, was someone added to the sudoers file, um, was someone able to go through and, um, you know, change keys, um, and all this information, we can actually gather that and provide it to our incident response group. Um, we can also then, if we need to, automate, um, you know, remediation of that system, get it back into that trusted state, um, which is critical uh, and, uh, with any of these attacks. So I think something I, I kind of want to drive home here is that, you know, Tripwire, we, we eat high impact vulnerabilities for breakfast. Um, you know, if you really look at, um, you know, all of our, our core products and how they work together, um, they provide a, a number of security controls to help mitigate the risks um, when it comes to these high impact vulnerabilities. Um, when you're dealing with these vulnerabilities, there is no silver bullet. Um, I hate to say it, there's no single product that's going to help mitigate um, the, the, the risks. Uh, but with Tripwire, what we actually provide you is, you know, the ability to um, have visibility of your network, identify what systems might be vulnerable, and then to quickly identify, you know, those hazards that we talked about. Um, quickly go through and identify what systems may have been compromised, what systems have been exploited, and allows you to do that continuously. Um, and that's something that I think is really critical and really important for, for dealing with these uh, vulnerabilities. Um, I didn't go too in depth into our products and how they would uh, mitigate these um, the, the risks, but um, I, I really want to invite you to, to reach out to our sales team or um, reach out to me directly, and I can get you in touch with um, um, some of our product specialists. Um, and we can talk a bit more about how all of our products work together to help solve this um, this real, very real problem that um, all of you are facing. And I also wanted to let you know that uh, we will be sending an email out um, with what I like to call the High Impact um, um, Vulnerability Survival Kit that includes a number of resources, um, uh, white papers and other documents, um, and it will even include that, uh, you know, the mapping of the NIST Android 5.3 to the um, CSC uh, Top 20, um, but it will have a lot of resources available for you um, to kind of go through and do some additional research into this. And with that, I think we would like to open it up for uh, Q&A. Let's see, I think I got one question. And yeah, and so far one question is, uh, you know, can I get a copy of the PowerPoint? And yes, we will make that available to you as well as with these other, um, these other resources. Um, and if you guys have any other questions too, uh, feel free to, um, you know, email me directly. Um, if I can't answer the question, I can uh, make sure that I get you uh, over to someone that can answer that. Um, you know, if you want a more uh, deep dive, more uh, um, in-depth technical demo of how our products actually uh, mitigate some of these real threats, uh, we can even show you uh, some actual, actual real exploits um, and how it um, sort of raises a lot of flags within our products. Um, so I invite you to, uh, to do that as well. Um, and with that, I think uh, that's the end of our webcast. Thank you so much, Ken, and uh, for this informative presentation today. And thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you uh, enjoyed yourself. As mentioned earlier by myself and just Ken, um, we will be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and to the slide deck. Also, you may reply to that email if you'd like to earn a CPE credit for attending the webcast today. We hope that you'll join us on future webcasts check out tripwire.com for future events. Also check out our blog, State of Security. Thank you and have a great day.